God wants to use us, and I believe that God is preparing us for a once in a generation. But let me tell you this. There is something in our way that's going to hold us back from being a part of it. Something in our way that's going to keep us from really being able to get everything we can for his glory. Something that's going to hold us back from making even a bigger impact, seeing more people come to Christ. There's something that actually thwarts a harvest. And Jesus tells us what it is in Luke chapter 10, very famous verses. He says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. It doesn't matter how great the harvest is if you don't have enough workers to take hold of that harvest. That's really what I want to address today. I want to address really what Jesus says, that the problem with harvest is not fruitfulness, but it's faithfulness. And so what I'm challenging our church and all across Chicagoland area today, this sermon is really moving us into the theme that I feel like God is leading us into which is this theme and idea of all hands on deck. All hands on deck. This is the idea of a situation that's happening which every available person is needed to be called upon to assist in the task. It comes from sailmen, uh, sailors who were on boats who during uh, unusual seasons or storms would call and say, all hands on deck, signaling to everybody that's below that may be involved in something else or may be uh, not engaged or sleeping to get to the top of the deck because your help is needed because if you don't help, we don't get to where we're called to get. And I believe that's the same. And I don't think this is a new problem because Jesus said this 2,000 years ago. I think this is a problem that has plagued the church since the very beginning. A great harvest with the power of God able to uh, uh, reap that harvest. And yet the church oftentimes has sat on the sidelines or the many have really been few. But new life, what would it look like? If we acknowledge the spiritual time and the God season that we're in, what would it look like if in 2024 we got serious about being fully committed? What would your life look like if you said, listen, I, 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 I've maybe been playing games or been holding some things back, but in this year, I'm not holding back. What would it look like if not just a few of us were carrying the load across the church, but what if everyone in this room realized they're gifting and the authority and calling upon their life and rose up to say, hey, Jesus, I, I, I want to be used for your kingdom and your glory. We are not willing that Chicago would go to hell, Jesus. We want to stand up as the church with the light of the gospel, empowered by the Holy Spirit, clothed with his power, to be able to bring the good news to Chicagoland area in a way where thousands and thousands of lives that you and I care about, people that are dear to us, would be changed for all eternity's sake. I want to talk to us about that. Three things that we need to be fully committed in to see God do what he's going to do. And I'm going to bring us to a passage in Luke chapter 9. Actually, it's the previous verses right before this. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few in chapter 10. And I want to give credit, as I was studying this passage, you come across different pastors or theologians that have framed the language to capture the idea. And so I want to give credit to Pastor Chuck Swindoll, who I just, after I came across his language for the points, I said, all right, I'm just going to go with his. That's better than I think I can come up with. So I, I want to give credit to um, just his language that he has for these points. So here, here's the first point. Three things that we need to be fully committed to. Number one, we need to have unreserved sacrifice. Jesus says in Luke chapter 9, verse 57, he says, As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the son of man, referring to himself, a term out of Daniel that spoke of deity, has no place to lay his head. Jesus, in this scene, has been ministering village to village, sharing news of the kingdom, God's kingdom, what he's gonna do, 
the life that you can have if you live close with God, the forgiveness that he's going to bring, a sprinkling in each village, letting people know of what he's going to do on the cross and that he will resurrect again. I mean, he, he was clear about these things as he communicated, even in parables. And as Jesus is going village to village, it tells us in the verses before that he knows at the end of the road that Jerusalem is there. It's important because Jerusalem is the place that he would be crucified. Jerusalem was the final stop on the journey. The reason he came to earth, uh, not just to teach good teachings, but to give his life on the cross for us. Jesus knew that that was just around the corner. And so Jesus is, wants to teach with clarity about what it means to follow him. Now, of course, following Jesus as he's going from village to village, it, it, you know, from a speaker's standpoint, it's, it's pretty nice. Jesus shows up at a town and there is buzz there. I Maybe mean, people ask, Jesus? Jesus is in? He's come to our town? Crowds are around him. Sometimes he even has to go into a boat to teach because the people are pressing him so much. I mean, just people want to hear. They want to hear Jesus teach with authority like no one else. They, they've heard of Jesus putting hands on people and healing them from decades-long diseases that they had in their body. They, 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 they get around Jesus and they see the, the authority, the miracles, the crowd, the praises that he has when he goes into and ministers into a town. And it tells us that while Jesus is on this road, that there's a man that comes up to him and says, I will follow you wherever you go. That's a strong commitment. I'm, I'm loyal. Choose me, Jesus. I'm ready to sign on board and join the entourage. Matthew chapter 8 tells us a little bit more about this man for context. It tells us that this man was a scribe, which would have been a religious expert in his day. I mean, he knew the Old Testament inside and out. This man was very learned in the scriptures. And so there's a religious scribe who's saying, Jesus, I want to be a part of your entourage. I want to follow you. Now, my guess, if I didn't know the verses that came next, would be like, Jesus would be like, all right, I needed 13. Let's get you on board. Let's have you join the gang. Here's a t-shirt, man. Join the group. It's not Jesus' response, though. He responds almost in this cryptic language. Foxes have dens. Birds have nests, but I have no place to lay my head. What was Jesus trying to tell a very eager follower of his in the area of commitment? This guy's ready to sign his life away, ready to fully commit, and Jesus stops him and says, you don't really understand what you're in for. And what he points to, what Jesus is trying to be clear about here, is that to follow Jesus, you have to be willing to embrace a life of discomfort and sacrifice. A lot of people, they, they want to follow Jesus because they see the benefits. Man, Jesus, it seems like people are happier. It seems like they have more peace. It seems like they're more connect, connected. It's a people that's on a mission together. They're doing good. And so there's a lot of things in Christianity that draw people to you know, the attraction of Jesus and what, what Jesus can offer. But let me tell you this. It's not only the good things that are part of the package deal to follow Jesus. Jesus speaking to a scribe who for sure is seeing the crowds and the authority and seeing the benefits of following Jesus. Jesus wants to give them the other side of the coin. And say, oh, that's good. Oh, that's amazing. Oh, that's the best. But that's not everything it is to follow me. To follow me comes embracing discomfort. and You will have to sacrifice things to follow me. He's saying it won't be easy. There's a lot of other easier things you can do than follow me. And he points to the fact in this, it's kind of funny. He's pointing and basically saying even the animals have it better than I do. Like if you had a dog and Jesus was teaching this in your house, he'd say, even fluffy. <laughs> your dog's got the premium bed, really stuffed up, got a little name over its bed. Jesus is like, even fluffy's got it better than me. He said, even foxes have homes and birds have nests. But he's like, I don't even have a place to, what was he saying? He's saying, following, G, following God, living for God means that I've had to embrace sacrifice. I've had to give up some things to follow God. And he's saying, and to follow me, you're going to have to give up some things 
if you want to fully follow me wherever I'm calling you to go. It's not just an easy road, it's a narrow road. And Jesus wanted his followers to understand not just the benefits, but the sacrifices. Sometimes forsaking comfort for, which, for that which comes first. I followed Jesus for some time now, and many of you have in the room. Tell me if following Jesus has been hard at some times, right? Following Jesus sometimes require us to have the discomfort of being disliked. You stand up and say, I'm going to follow Jesus. You're not one of those obnoxious Christians either. There, there are obnoxious Christians. Let's just put that out there, right? <laughs> but you're, you're just trying to follow Jesus, live for Jesus. And there is people in your life that the simple fact that you said, I follow Jesus, they want nothing to do with you. That is not easy. That's uncomfortable. That is a sacrifice. There's times in our life where we have to follow Jesus and he leads us to the discomfort of the sacrifice of even having to share our faith with other people. Hey, that's a beautiful thing to share the good news, but can, I tell, can we be honest? Sometimes that's uncomfortable. You're telling somebody about truth. They don't really believe it. You're trying to encourage them. You're trying to explain to them, but maybe they have hurt or baggage or whatever it is, but that is a stretch to do. The discomfort of, and the sacrifice of taking steps of obedience. God tells you to forgive somebody. And you're like, oh God, do you know what they did, God. God goes, I call, I'm, I'm calling you. I know, God, but they, they really hurt me. And, and God goes, yeah, yeah, but that's part of what following me is. You don't just take the easy road or do what you want to do. Following me is not just benefits, but it's sacrifice. I'm calling you to live a life that's different than everybody else. And it's how God works as, you, as he leads us in our life. I'll never forget a few months ago, uh, I was in a barber shop and I was getting my hair cut and I'm sitting in the seat, probably reading off my phone, and the Lord spoke to me and said, Josiah, I want you to pay for the person getting their hair cut in front of you. And I'm just like, oh, Lord. <laughs> Why me? <laughs> I know Jesus, love Jesus, share my faith, love people. But I'm like, man, I'm in a barber shop with all dudes. Scarface on the TV, rap music played in the background. I'm like, this is not my ideal setting, God, to like really like, you know, just bless somebody like that. And I'm looking across and, you know, the guy, and so, so I'm, I'm wrestling with this, wrestling with this. And it comes to the end and I just, I just, I'm wrestling with how is he going to respond to me? And is he going to, is he going to be, you know, is he going to be happy? Is he going to be like, dude, what are you, what are you, why are you, what are you, what are you trying to get? Or, I don't know. I'm. I'm running through scenarios, you know, like what? What could happen here? And I finish the haircut, zzz, finishes, and, and, and I, 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 I'm like, I'm just, you, all I can think about is that I'm supposed to pay for this guy. I don't know what's gonna happen. I know what he's gonna say. And I take a step towards him, and then I walk right out the door. <laughs> don't you judge me. <laughs> don't. Half of you in the room, same thing. And I walked right past him, walked out the door, got in my car, and I'm not kidding, more than, no, no more than a half a block down the road, and I feel, you felt it, I feel this intense conviction from the Holy Spirit. And I just feel him telling me, Josiah, I called you to that discomfort. I called you to that sacrifice. I called you to give of what was yours to somebody else. You don't need to know that person to even know the reason why, but this is the road and the life that I called you to. Don't just worship me in the good times, obey me in the hard times. You need to follow me as I'm guiding you down this path. This is what it means to be a follower of mine. You've ever felt that conviction? You're just trying. You're, at that point, you're like, I'll, I'll do whatever, God. I mean, and so I'm trying to now take whatever step I can to try to rectify the situation. And so I called my barber, have him paid, said, hey, I want you to pay. I'll pay you double, pay for the guy across. And, you know, I don't know whatever would have come of that situation and God, why God prompted me to have that conversation. I don't know, because I drove away. Right? I, I didn't do what I was supposed to in the time. It's not just doing the right thing, but it's doing it at the right time. 
And I didn't do it at the right time. But I'll tell you what, that's exactly how God works in our life. At a time you don't expect, when you, it's not a comfortable setting, God calls you and says, hey, as a follower of mine, I'm going to stretch you. And I'm going to tell you to do things. I'm going to lead you to do things that are going to be uncomfortable and they're going to require sacrifice. But that's the life I'm calling you to. That's what it means to follow me. And as you step into obedience in those seasons of discomfort and that sacrifice, watch how I overwhelm your life with all of the goodness. But you cannot just take the good without the sacrifice and the discomfort. This is part of what it means to follow me. This is what Jesus is saying to this follower. He's saying, hey, you're really not ready to follow me yet because you think it's only the benefits. You don't understand and you're not willing to give up what it's going to take to follow me down the road I'm leading. The second thing that we see for full commitment in our lives to Jesus is undivided devotion. Listen to verse 59. This is the second follower. This time Jesus calls him out. He said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, this is harsh. Let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Jesus here is raising the bar to all those that will follow him. And it seems like what this guy is asking for, and it is, is a good thing. I mean, Jesus, he wants to follow you, just, just not right now. He has to, you know, bury his dad. And, and let me speak to this because most theologians that have dissected this passage believe that his father was not actually dead yet. Now, the reason they believe that is because in Jewish culture, they would embalm the body of a dead person immediately and then put them in the grave. In other words, if his dad was really dead, he wouldn't be here. He would be burying his dad already. So the fact that he's here suggests to us that he's actually asking something else. Well, what is he asking? He's asking that he would be able to go back and take care of his dad until he dies. Once again, still a good thing. Like, Jesus, this guy wants to follow you. He just has some things that need to be dealt with and, and, and figured out and things he needs to take care of before he fully commits. But Jesus wanted to be clear that he was asking for something more. This man was asking for an indefinite time period that, he, that could drag on and on before he fully committed to Jesus. He was saying... I want to be fully committed, but just not yet. How does he say it explicitly? I will follow you, but first let me. Have you ever had that around you? People, they want to live for God. They, they, they want to forget. You ever seen some of this? Like, they want to live for God. They, but they say, God, I'm going to live committed and sold out for you, Jesus. But first, let me get through my 20s. I stepped on a toe there. There was something that just reverberated. Like, I'm 20, I'm young, I'm single. I still got my looks. My hair's still here, Jesus. Like, I'm going to live for you. I know you exist. So I'm going to live for you. But I just let me do me and then I'm going to follow you. Sometimes it's Jesus, I want to live fully committed and follow you. Gee, I want to be sold out. But first, let me let my kids all graduate from the, from a college. Lord, I want to live fully for you. But first, let me finish my business, God, or get to the place that I want to get to my career. Some people, Lord, I'm going to go, Lord, I'm going to go to Africa. I'm going to live fully committed. I'm, I'm going to leave everything behind. I'm going to sell everything I have. I'm going to go to Africa. God, I'm going to go build an orphanage over in Africa. Some of you are not even honest with yourself. <laughs> you say, I'm going to do that. But here's it. But first, let me retire. First, let me, first, let me and what ends up happening is sometimes in our life, we spend our entire journey telling God that TBD, 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 one day in the future, I'm going to be fully committed. And oh, God, you're going to be blown away by how committed I am. Oh, I'm going I'm to I'm give it all, God. 
One day in the future, I'm going to commit and I'm going to surrender and I'm going to go. And God, and God is saying, yeah, I hear what you're saying, but you're always talking about someday in the future, sometime in the future, when your plans are done, when you're going. And some of us are so busy building our own empire that we never build his kingdom. This man is wanting to follow Jesus, but there's even something good in his life. The highest commitment in Jewish culture was that of taking care of your parents and burying your dad. Making sure his estate was all good and settled. I mean, this is a good thing. And yet Jesus is drawing a new line. He's saying even more important than the most closest loved ones you have, you need to be committed to me. Even more than the things in your culture that everybody says, that's super important. Jesus says, it is, but I supersede that. And the people that are going to follow me, don't follow, don't promise me someday in the future you're going to follow me. What Jesus is asking of this follower to be fully committed is don't tell me first let me. Jesus is saying, I want you to commit now. I want you to be fully committed now. It's easy to talk about how you're going to serve me in the future, but Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. I gave you everything, so I'm requiring everything. You're going to follow me. I'm calling you to sacrifice, but I'm calling you to draw lines where you say, Jesus, I'm not going to plan you in my calendar in the future, but Jesus, you are today, and I'm going to give all that I am to you now. Jesus wanted him to follow him now. It was a choice between good and what's best. The third area and the final area that Jesus calls us to fully commit in is this, I, this area of unwavering commitment. He wants us to be fully bought in and have unwavering com- commitment. Verse 61 says this, still another said, I will follow you, Lord. But first, there's that language again. But first, let me go and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. You know, when Jesus says, looking back here, the literal language in the Greek is the things behind. The things behind. We all have things behind us. We all have things in our past. We all have things that call to us, that we, 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 we put away. We left behind. We've moved on from. But they still try to draw us back, right? They still, every once in a while when things get hard, they try to like, hey, but what about this road? What about this path? What about this comfort? Man, it's a tough road, Jesus, but what if, you, what if you do this? This follower, once again, good thing, just wanted to go back and say goodbye to their family. So Jesus, I'm, I'm gonna be fully sold out, committed follower of yours. I'm ready to hit the road with you, get the t-shirt, but Jesus, I just need to say goodbye to my family. Just let me go back and say goodbye to my loved ones. You know, I think there's something about sometimes the things that we go back to even just once hold us there for longer than we think. Jesus knew that this man going back to his family, maybe he would never meet Jesus on the road again. That he would be with his family. His mom would be crying and say, son, I don't want you to go. And I mean, it's going to be tough in Jerusalem. And this man's weighing and saying, maybe, well, maybe I haven't think through things. Maybe it was my emotions. Maybe I wasn't ready. Jesus knew that this man going back home would have meant that he was not willing to ever be fully committed to him. And sometimes that's how it is. The thing we go, just, just one more time at the bar. I just want to say goodbye to my friends. The game's on? Oh, man, let me spend a, just finish the game with you guys. We're friends, right? You know, but I'm not coming back here again. No more. I said, this is the last time. And three, four hours later, you're there. You're more time and you're more drunk than you thought you would be. What is it? You think, well, it's just one time. It's just going back. Sometimes you go back to that old relationship one time and you're back in that trap for a long time. There's different things and they're not all bad. Sometimes they're good things that we go back to. Sometimes there's the right path and there's the easy path. And it's easy, the temptation of the easy path that tries to draw you back. When you're wrestling and you're following God on the path that he's called you to, and you're like, ah, oh, man, the life for my family could be so much easier if we just went back. And this picture that Jesus is giving is a farmer who's on the plow, and he has his hands, and he's pushing it, and there's an animal in front carrying, and he's making this line, preparing the, uh, for, for, the, uh, for, for the work that he's going to do in the field. But here's what's interesting. As they would plow this ground, the person that had their hands on the plow would have their eyes set on a fixed 
point in front of them. As they're making a line, if they would take their eyes off of what's in front of them, the fixed point, the line, of course, would not stay stay straight. I see this all the time with my little son. I don't know why he does this, but even this morning, he was running and we're behind him and he runs like this. We, we, we're like, saying, don't, but he's just like totally looking back, running forward, and just walls in front of him. And it's simple and it's silly, but we're like, hey, saint, like, let's look at Dada. Let's look at Mama. Let's not like run into the wall over here. And I'm trying to say, hey, it's simple, but, but when you look back and you're moving forward, you go off course. Jesus is saying, you, I'll hear this. He's saying, you cannot be fully committed to me if you're still looking back. Some of you, for you to step into 2024 and be fully committed like no other time in your season is going to require you to cut some cords, to sever some things, to burn some bridges, and leave some things behind. Because if you hold on to that, you will never live the calling that God has for you. And in the moment, it feels better to go back and glance at the possibilities, but Jesus is saying, don't look back. Sometimes we flirt with the past or other seasons of what life could be, and Jesus is saying, don't look back. I'm not calling you to look back anymore. I'm calling you to leave those things behind. Leave that relationship behind. Leave that money behind. Leave that job behind. Leave that sack. Whatever it is in your story, you know, if God's speaking to you, you know that while you're trying to live fully committed, that every time you glance back, you go off course. I don't know why. And Jesus is saying, because when you take your eyes off of me, The road that I make straight is not straight anymore because you take your hands and whatever you look at is where you go. He's saying you cannot look forward. You cannot move forward if you're looking back. Some of you, that's the word right there. That if you keep looking back at things in past seasons or the past year or past relationships or past friendships, God's called you, some of you in the room, God's called you to leave some friendships behind and you has been developed, but it's, you're struggling to develop those new friendships. It's hard. You feel like, I'm not connecting, and I connected better with those, but you know God told you to leave that behind. And you're trying to build this, but it's hard, and it's in those hard moments that we get tempted to look back. And looking back is compromising. Looking back is saying, I'm not fully committed. And you know, we wouldn't say that, but it's what happens. And so Jesus is saying, listen, if you want to move forward like no other time and be fully committed to me, you have to leave those things behind.